the founder of the Palo Alto Incubator Archimedes Lab. He's also CEO of Just Me, and if you know about Just Me, they were actually featured in the Apple Store uh, just yesterday, I think. Yes. And previously, he's got a long list here. <laughs> he was co-founder of TechCrunch, the founder of Real Names, uh, which is a Palo Alto-based uh, company specializing in internet navigation and search technologies, co-founder of the EasyNet Group, and co-founder of Siberia, which is amazing. It was the world's first uh, internet cafe. What was that, back in 96? 94. <laughs> and he's also founder of Seascape, which was started back in 83. So he is truly a visionary. You also see funded net names, the first domain name reseller in the world, and also chairman of the board of directors. And you also sat on the board of Veriscience Naming and Directory Services Division. Welcome to you. So uh, an interesting fact about one of those companies, Real Names, is that Real Names, which was started in 1997, created the first ever uh, navigation system that worked for simplified and traditional Chinese. You, it was native language uh, navigation in China. My partner in China was Scenic, who runs the .cn registry. And we had a partnership in Taiwan, we had partnerships in Korea and Japan as well. And we made it possible to map a string characters to a URL so that you could type in your own language, for example, uh, Shanghai City Council, and it would go to the correct URL, which was, of course, in Latin characters, because the URL could be in Latin. So Real Names was big in China, uh, and Japan, and Korea, and Taiwan, all, all over the world. And I spent a lot of time, mainly in Beijing, uh, between 1997 and 2002. So I'm very, very familiar with business in China. But what I want to talk about today affects uh, the globe, including China, and that is, uh, what I was asked to speak about is the global revolution in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm going to go quick because we don't have a lot of time. So the first thing that's worth saying, and this is of course self-evident, but as we have lived through history, and I am 59 years old, so I've lived through a lot of history. Uh, I lived through the beginnings of the database when networking first came in. I lived through the start of uh, the time when uh, computers were linked together not on the internet, but to CompuServe and AOL. And then EasyNet was an internet service provider. In 1994, it was the first one in Europe. I was the chief technology officer and co-founder, probably a year before the internet was popular, which was very good timing. Uh, EasyNet did an IPO two years later. Um, uh, then we looked through the move from the internet as portals, like Yahoo, to the internet as web services, web to web. And now we've moved in from the internet as web services to the mobile era. And every single one of these changes has killed companies and created new ones. Because it's very hard for a company from a previous era that was successful in that era to also be successful in the next era. It's incredibly difficult, almost impossible. Uh, it doesn't mean they can't survive. IBM is still alive. It just isn't IBM anymore. Microsoft is still alive. Microsoft anymore. And uh, I might surprise you with some of the things I'm going to say. Start with a fact. This is a smartphone and tablet shippers compared to PC and notebook shippers. And in 2010 to 2011, for the first time, the number shifted. And this is projected to 2015 in tablets and smartphones versus PCs and notebooks. That's a, a raw statistic, but it means a huge difference in human behavior, in what software we use in particular. The software that was built for these devices, we can think of it, Facebook was built for those devices, Google Search was built for these devices. Uh, how relevant is it going to be for these devices? Probably not very. And that is a 
big thing to say, especially at a time when Facebook is going strong and Google is going strong. Uh, but when the landscape changes, uh, you know, everything changes. This is just tablets compared to PCs and notebooks, taking out smartphones. And for the first time here in the end of 2012, even tablet shipments alone exceeded PC and notebook shipments combined. And look how quickly it did it. From nothing in 2009 to being as big as the entire PC and notebook market within three years, three to four years. Massively fast compared to how fast PCs and notebooks grew at a much more linear uh, rate. And this is how it looks like in terms of iPad versus iPhone. Tablets are growing even faster than the iPhone group, even faster than the iPhone, which already was huge. So we can see the world is changing. What does that mean for people? Well, the first thing it means is that already today, people are spending less time in a web browser and more time in apps. The web browser, which was the primary interface through which we access software for the last 10 years, is now in decline, relative decline, compared to the application ecosystem. In that sense, in mobile, not in general, but in mobile, the web is currently in a state of coma. It really isn't growing at all. Some people believe that HTML5 will change that. I'm not one of those. I think that we have set in a new course which is pretty much deeply embedded within the global culture now. And the apps represent the future. HTML5 is going to be a tool that those apps can use, will use uh, in many ways, uh, to deliver service. So this is not evolution. Uh, it, it isn't Chiang Kai-shek. It's massive time. This is a revolution. It's an absolute change. And it affects hardware, software, it affects advertising, and it leads to some new opportunities. Let's start with hardware. If you look hard enough, you'll find scenes like this all over the world today. You throw these things out and go to place them. That means that brands like these brands are literally going up in flames. Big companies, huge companies, that simply are either ceasing to exist or changing to such an extent that you no longer recognize them. And other brands are winning. Brands which previously were small are becoming huge. Android really isn't a brand, it's a marketing label. And it covers lots of companies, but the biggest one within that, of course, is Samsung. But now in China, there's huge Android companies growing up as well with their own flavor. This is the global smartphone unit market share between 2010, Q1, and Q4, 2012. And look at how it changed in such a small space of time. That first graph included lots of Nokia. The second graph, not so much. It's all Samsung and Apple, with a bit of LG and one or two others. And, and, and this is just the beginning, because now wearable computing is joining uh, smartphones and tablets as additional types of mobile devices, <coughs> devices that you carry around with you, in this case, that you wear, but nonetheless mobile. No one really knows whether Google Glass is going to be a huge success or just a joke. Uh, it's, it could be either one right now, but it's a very, very great experiment. Uh, with the future, whichever of us it ends up being, it's going to influence whatever comes next in the very least. It may be one from that. The wearable watch that talks by a low-power Bluetooth to your smartphone, so that you can leave the one in your pocket and do everything on the watch. Uh, iBeacons, which is Apple's latest innovation on top of low-power Bluetooth that allows your phone to talk to your surroundings so that you have context um, wherever you go. Um, where's the nearest restroom might be something you can discover. Where do I go to get dinner? 
within a building like something that you can discover. As these ID cameras start to be telling information about the world around you, and deliver that information to your mobile device. So we're only at the very, very beginning of, of this revolution. Software is no less impacted. This is the network as it looked in the Web 2.0 era. The Web 2.0 era really only came to uh, the beginning of its end in the last couple of years. We had a whole bunch of highly centralized cloud-based networks like Facebook or, or even Google, where you join the club, you give your credentials, you upload your contacts, and you manage everything through a browser uh, as this service provider uh, does everything for you uh, on your command. It's a highly centralized cloud-based social network. Uh, on the other, and, and there's lots of them. We've shown four here, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Google. They're pretty much the same architecture. But the network as it looks today looks more like this. There is no center anymore. Now, our contacts are on our phone in the address book. And your contacts are on your phone in your address book. And I can send you a message without going through Facebook or Google using iMessage or SMS or email for that matter. So we'd be getting to a decentralized network with a device in everybody's pocket that carries all the data around with them that they need to communicate, to share, to remember. So we are already moving from centralized software to decentralized. It isn't that the cloud goes away. In fact, if anything, the cloud gets bigger and more important, but it plays a different role. It's no longer the centralized us. It's now just the glue between us. Um, and that's a very different set of software and problems than the, than the web 2.0 cloud. You can see a good sign of that with uh, Apple's fingerprint technology that they released today. Uh, in the old days, by which I mean yesterday, the way that you authentic authenticated who you are was through a centralized authentication system full of security. The way we're going to do it tomorrow is on the device itself. Only the device will know your fingerprint, the cloud won't know your fingerprint, and the device will say to the service, he's good to go, that's what he meant. And it all happened in the device in a decentralized way. And all of the logic and all of the security issues will be right now on the device, no longer centralized in the cloud, which is a great example of trend. I call it the thin cloud and the thick, rich device. So with social on a greater scale, however, it's not as if the end of centralization means the end of social. It actually means the proliferation of social. Uh, WhatsApp. Who uses WhatsApp in the room? Probably quite a few of you. Or WeChat, Wechat, or Line, or KakaoTalk, lots of them. Those are messaging clients sending literally billions of messages a day between us, but with no social network involved anywhere. It's just phone to phone, uh, app to app. No social network, but more social than any social network was. This is uh, the number of messages being delivered by apps like WeChat compared to SMS. And you can see in 2012, for the first time, SMS became the smallest mobile messaging platform. And what we call over the top messaging, that is to say, not going through AT&T, not going through Verizon, but app to app on your smartphone, is now bigger than SMS. Uh, so you can see that uh, social glue through the cloud is, is, is uh, you know, dominating our interactions with each other. So that should mean that Facebook is the next one that this happens to. It doesn't mean it will be. But Facebook clearly has an architecture that has no place in this new world other than as an attempt to survive, to somehow shoehorn their architecture from 2005 into the 2013 world. And they may well succeed. They'll be the first to do so as a generation shifts. But they're smart. And they've already shown with mobile advertising that they can adapt. So it would be crazy to predict the death of Facebook. But Facebook certainly is an architecture not built for this era. 
Mark Zuckerberg recently uh, shipped Facebook Home. He actually took the Android operating system and replaced it with a Facebook application that dominates the phone, that glued together the social networking of Facebook with a messaging application into a single uh, shell that sits on top of the Android OS. Uh, they tried to sell the phone to the $99, it was an HTC phone. Within three weeks, they reduced the price to 99 cents because nobody bought it. So that's how hard it is for Facebook to move. It's not easy, uh, but they are trying. And my guess is they'll be just like IBM or Microsoft or AOL for that matter. They will be somewhat successful in surviving. It's just they aren't the future. The state of the mobile world today is a little bit like this. Who knows what this is? Hands up if you know what this big is the software. You're probably much too young. Someone shout it out. Windows 3.1. In Windows 3.1, you've got an operating system on a device that had lots of apps, and each app did one thing. And over there, you've got the iPhone, which is a device with an operating system with lots of apps, so each device does one, each app does one thing. What does this tell you? It tells you that no one's yet invented the software that's going to dominate the mobile phone. And it probably isn't going to just do one thing. Instagram, you know, I'll send a picture to a friend. Or WhatsApp, I'll chat with a friend or some friends. And one pony app is great, but the future probably is more sophisticated than that. And it is yet to be invented. How about advertising? Uh, I call this unnatural apps. It's if your business was built from web advertising, and you make billions of dollars a year from putting banner ads or text ads onto web pages. What do you do as the world moves from desktop and laptop and web to mobile and apps? Well, you have to do unnatural things to try to survive. This is the total revenue from web advertising, $36.6 billion in 2012. This is mobile advertising, $3.4 billion in the same year. So around about 10%. But the mobile traffic is now close to 30% and heading towards much higher numbers. So it isn't feasible that $36 billion can be generated from a declining web ecosystem um, and, be, and, and not need to be replaced. Somehow it needs to be replaced. Well, there's challenges there. The cost per thousand eyeballs on the web to an advertiser is about three dollars and fifty cents on average. On mobile, it's only seventy-five cents. So for every person you lose on the web, you have to replace them sufficiently to turn seventy-five cents into three dollars fifty. That's what, what is that? Five times? Something like that. So for every eyeball you lose, you have to gain five on mobile. Uh, that isn't happening, so there's, there's a gap. Uh, the CPM changes according to the app as well. On weather, it's very high. On games, it's much lower. And some things, there's no CPMs at all because it's worthless. Google's mobile cost of click in the quarter that this relates to is 41% lower than it is on the desktop. So what's happening? This kind of thing. This is a Facebook screen uh, trying to get you to interact. This, these are push notifications coming from Facebook saying, please engage with us so that we can get more eyeballs, so that we can get revenue from, from your use of Facebook. But, but, uh, at the bottom there, this is a, a well-known guy who says, well, since when does Facebook send you a push notification when friends come online? Do not want and I can't find any setting to turn it off. Here's another example. An email from Facebook. Find more of your friends, please, because we need you to engage with them so that we can put ads in front of them. So what does it mean? Well, one of the interesting things that it might mean is that Android is bad for Google. Because 
all of Google's revenue, minus a little bit, comes from web apps. But every time someone buys an Android phone, they stop using their web browser on their desktop a little bit, sometimes a lot. So as people replace desktop use with mobile use, and there are no equally lucrative apps to put on mobile, Google loses revenue relative to that shift. It's not an absolute loss, it's a relative loss. So it doesn't impact Google's top line yet, it sometimes does impact the bottom line, uh, but it will. It's just logic, it has to. And therefore, there needs to be a sh shift, and Sergey, for the last couple of years, has been working on what's called X projects, which is, what does Google do next? Because it has to have an answer to that. And again, Google may prosper, uh, but it certainly can't relax. So what opportunities does this give rise to? Well, the first thing it gives rise to is the opportunity to build software for decentralized networks. Uh, by the way, just to disclose, that's exactly what Just Me is. Just Me is like Facebook meets Instagram meets WhatsApp, combining features of messaging and social networking, using the address book on the phone as your friends. It doesn't require you to ever upload those to anybody else. You just use them to share pictures or videos or text or whatever you want to do. Software for decentralized networks is, is, a, is a huge opportunity. WhatsApp, WeChat, and others are already showing that. Uh, if you can do that, you leverage this architecture, which is happening anyway. Despite what software guys do, this is happening anyway. It's a global opportunity. Uh, think about prior to iPhone. If you're a software developer and you wanted to ship an app to 200 countries in the world, uh, you want to translate that app into the languages of those countries and then make it available for sale or for free in those countries. It would have been a huge task. And I remember when I did real names, like the advice I got was, do the US first, then maybe do China next. You know, but don't try and do everywhere all the time. Well, that isn't true anymore because Apple and Google have both built app stores. In the case of Apple, it's 135 countries. In the case of Google, I think it's 124 countries. And with one, one push of a button, you can have an app in native language in all of those countries. And so you certainly have a global distribution medium that just wasn't there before. Having said that, this bottom area is how many people in the world have the internet compared to the population of the world. There's still a lot of upside. And this is how many people have smartphones compared to mobile phones. Still a huge amount of upside. So we're just at the beginning. And what I want to do now is ask the question, uh, how is Silicon Valley responding? This is uh, funding over the period since 2007, with the big upward pointing part of the graph showing angel funding, the red part showing series A funding, the green series B, and the blue series C. So there's been a huge rocket in funding companies in the incubation and angel stage, typically raising between $20,000 and a million dollars maybe a little bit more on occasion, a uh, huge lift. But there hasn't been a similar lift in Series A funding. There's a huge gap. They call it the Series A crunch. When the incubator companies or the angel funding companies get to the point where they run out of money and need the next round, there is no next round available. This is uh, Ernst & Young's venture capital report from last year. The yellow bit is a bit to read. VC funds are investing fewer dollars at a later stage and on tougher terms. So think of the contrast. We have probably the biggest opportunity the world has ever seen because of the transformation of the fundamentals of computing delivered by the smartphone app, and the tablet age or the wearable age. We also have a lack of 
mid to late stage funding. All we have is incubation funds. Y Combinator, five hundred startups. Nothing wrong with them, they're great. But they're just the first step. If the second step is missing, here's what happens. The bottom they go blood bath. This is actually a real picture taken from a documentary about dolphins being killed uh, to eat, actually, in uh, Japan. But at the top there, you've got, here's a valley. You've got two guys on either side. You've got incubation dollars, the Series A crunch. A lot of companies don't raise Series A and they get acqui hired. Um, Sean, where's Sean? Sean's not in the room anymore. But I noticed a little message pop up on his laptop from Kevin Nielsen, who works with him. Kevin Nielsen, two weeks ago, worked for me. Uh, he's, he's now working for Google because we couldn't afford to pay them more. Because just me couldn't raise a Series A And that shift back into Google, or Facebook, or Yahoo, or LinkedIn, uh, of startup entrepreneurs and engineers who can't get Series A, so they get acquired if they're good enough. It's, it's tangible, real. The ones who don't get acquired end up down here. And then they go back to go. They raise another twenty thousand dollars, come up with another idea, and try again. That's kind of the cycle of the value right now. What's good about it is there's a lot of experimentation going on. What's bad about it is uh, the winners get decided in about six months. And most good ideas take more than six months to be winners. So good ideas die early. <coughs> Huge problem. This was the sketch I did on the airplane that resulted in me doing that slide. And some people told me this is better than that. <laughs> so I thought I'd give you a chance to see the clean version. <laughs> You've all seen the movie How to Train a Dragon by your kids. So think about the implications of what I just showed you for what entrepreneurs do. How, do, how are we training entrepreneurs? Well, it goes roughly something like this. Any of you who are angel investors will have had this conversation. Start at, the, your, uh, at my right, your left. I'll give you $15,000 or 7% of your company. That's more or less what Y Combinator says to people. The entrepreneur, of course, says yes, because he wants to be part of Y Combinator. He thinks it's a little bit expensive, 7% is a lot to give for $15,000, but you know, everyone else is doing it, so why not? So there's still 93% left. It's worth the risk. So they say yes. They've got three months to build something, and then they have a demo day. And most of them are very successful because they think about something they can build in three months, and they do the demo day, and they have some code to show. Well, they show their code, and the VCs are all in the audience, and basically very few, if any of them, get funding because what they built is too small to fund. It just isn't a big enough idea. Who wants to fund a small idea? Nobody. So you end up with this, what I call, self-inflicted work. The Valley has become, uh, the reason I left the UK, by the way, is because of this. This was the normal state of startup in the UK. And I moved to the Valley in 1998, having done an IPO, an easy net in the UK, where I didn't ever raise any capital, but we grew the company from revenue. And I left and said, I'm going to do my next company so in the Valley, because they know how to fund ideas for that. Sure enough, real net was raised $130 million between 1997 and 2002. Couldn't do that today. The Valley's more like England was in 1997 when I left. You have to figure out a way to bootstrap from revenue or by not paying everyone. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to make it. Because the only <coughs> way to get a big money is traction. And traction, of course, happens usually late in the life of the startup, not early. So uh, despite the big numbers of other global, um, it's not There's a poem which I'm going to end with. It's called Once More Into the Valley of Death, Road the 600. Uh, and it's Alfred Lord Tennyson, a famous English poem. I won't read the whole of it, but it's about a battle that British imperialism uh, conducted during the Inca Crusades, where 600 men were expected to ride into a valley where there was an enemy on both sides of the hill shooting at them. And um, they did, and they all died. But they were heroes for dying. And the poem celebrates what 
heroes they were. And it says there were cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them. They volleyed and thundered. They stormed out with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. But they had fought so well and came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of the 600, nothing was left of them, basically. So this point is great. Firstly, it's not value of death, uh, 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 which I think is an accurate depiction of what's happening to early stage startups in the valley right now. And secondly, it shows their heroism and bravery in even being there in the first place, which I think is also worth acknowledging for those families that are here trying to make this work when the odds against them are so huge. Um, they deserve that. So then the question is, what should you do? Well, here's another pencil sketch. I didn't have time to make the early version of this. On that side is all the incubated startups, simply raising $25,000 to $2 million, let's say as a range. On this side is growth capital. Uh, that's the kind of capital that Snapchat gets, where it's really unlimited. They've already broken through, they have huge traction. They could say I want to raise $40 million, and they can. They could say I want to raise $60 million, and they can. Uh, but in the middle, nothing, absolutely nothing. We've turned it to night and day. You're either in one pile or you're in the other pile. So where's the opportunity? Well, of course, I'm an entrepreneur. What do you do? You run towards the fire. The opportunity is in the middle. The Series A crunch, of course, what does it mean? Series A capital. So here's a promise. A year from now, if you remind me back, I will have at least a $200 million fund to only do Series A deals. Because that's what that is missing. No one's doing them. And that's what needs to get done. So anyone in the room who has the ability to write a check above a million dollars, come and see me. <laughs> <laughs> what do we need it for? To encourage big thinking, not small thinking. This is a big moment in history, we need big thinking. To help the incubators graduate their companies to the next stage instead of having them die. And to bring back Series A funding because without that, there's no life in the valley. Valley ends up being dead. And that's why we need a revolution, not an evolution. Done.